Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to this month's City Imagines, hosted by The Word on the Street. I'm Maya Bauman, your host, and we're excited to be presenting a conversation with Marcello De Cintio this evening on his newest nonfiction, Driven, The Secret Lives of Taxi Drivers, with author Amber Dawn in the interviewer's seat. This is episode eight, season two of The City Imagines, and the last iteration of this monthly event before our big September festival celebration, starting Thursday, September 16th to Sunday, September 26th. 10 days of storytelling, ideas, and imagination. Before we get into what the city imagines, we need to recognize what it already is. The Toronto of today exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805 with a final claim settlement in 2010. Watts Toronto also recognizes the history of the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Huron-Wendat, and the Seneca nations in this territory. The place in which Watts operates is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace. Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples with long histories on this land, and acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship and Indigenous solidarity that honours these peoples. We encourage you to educate yourself about the land you occupy wherever you're tuning in from. And now just a few announcements before we introduce tonight's panelists. Watts Weekly Features are wrapping up in August with more great deals during our Summer Reads Week, YA Literature Week, and Memoir Week. There's also one day left to enter the giveaway for one of three book packs, including titles from our Book Talk series. Sign up for the Weekly Features newsletter to enter. Our next Book Talk presentation will be a special feature and reading of The Hunter and the Old Woman by Pamela Korgamagi, read by House of Anansi editor Michelle McAleese. If you want to be the first to know about new videos from the Word on the Street, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you enjoyed tonight's talk, please give this video a like to help others find it as well. For more information about what we do or to sign up for our newsletters, please visit toronto.thewordonthestreet.ca. And now without any further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome our moderator for the evening, Amber Dawn. Amber Dawn is a writer and creative facilitator living on unceded Coast Salish territories in Vancouver, Canada. She is the author of four books and the editor of three anthologies. Welcome, Amber Dawn. Hi, thank you for having me. And our guest this evening, Marcello De Cintio, who is the award-winning author of five books, including Walls, Travels Along the Barricades, and Pay No Heed to the Rockets, Palestine in the Present Tense. De Cintio's newest book is Driven, The Secret Lives of Taxi Drivers. He lives in Calgary. Welcome, Hello. Marcello. Thank you, and thanks for having me. Thank you both for joining us this evening. I'll see you at the end of the hour. Hi, it's so great to be meeting with you, Marcello. I want to talk a little bit about your book, and I actually want to dig into some praise for your book straight away. Um, so bear with me while I compliment you, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, Driven, The Secret Lives of Taxi Drivers has received praise uh, from pretty much every national and regional book reviewer coast to coast, um, including McLean Magazine, Quill and Choir, the Globe and Mail, the Literary Review of Canada, and so on and so on. So really, I could be reading a buffet of pull quotes that would help us better <laughs> appreciate Driven's impact, um, but I've chosen just one. <laughs> um, and this quote is actually from Anne Logan's celebrated book blog, I've Read This. And Anne Logan writes, Alongside Di Cintio, we discover the magic behind these people and their stories painting a picture of the often turbulent lives of these blue collar workers that are so often forgotten by society. DiCintio's journalism skills are clearly evident in the rich descriptions and conversations he relays on the pages. But what makes his writing even better are the small asides he offers when making personal observations or poking fun at himself. I was happily engaged from beginning to end um, I want to echo that uh, while there is some really challenging content in Driven um, and many, many opportunities for us to pause and reflect on our own assumptions and values and life stories, um, there's also such kindness and humor and keenness to it, really keen curiosity throughout. Mm. Um, so I, I thank you for that. And um, within Logan's praise, I actually want to focus on one particular thing. And that's how she says, quote, blue collar workers are so often forgotten by society. 
how very true. Um, so often with nonfiction, we as writers, we, we don't have the benefit of starting at the so-called starting line, if you will, um, instead of kind of have to work back from pre-existing assumptions or under-representations before we can just truly arrive at those complex and authentic stories. Um, like other blue collar workers, there are stereotypes most certainly about taxi drivers. Um, so I have this big meaty two-parter question to get us started. Okay. Um, when you began Driven, what stereotypes or invisibilities did you have to kind of work back from? And then do you recall any particular kind of like aha moments that really allowed you to move forward into the, the rich intersectional and really personal writing that we find in the finished book? Yeah, well, that was, thank you so much, Amber John, for that. And, and uh, yeah, Anne's very kind and, and, and so are you. And, and um, yeah, you know, the, you know, it's, fu it's funny, this was, this book, I was so, uh, uh, going into it from the beginning, there was more, more than any other book I've written, this was about, um, uh, it, it was, it was what I wasn't looking for versus what I was looking for. And what I wasn't looking for was the, was the kind of the cliches and stereotypes that, 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 that you, that you mentioned, right? And, and there's two, and I talk about this in the introduction, there's two that main things that I wanted to avoid. And the first is this, is the idea of uh, I wanted to avoid the, the the taxi noir stories. I wanted to avoid the 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 taxi driver as this overseer of the seedy underbellies of of, of big cities and uh, uh, who's there to you know to to just kind of chronicle the the uh, bad behavior going on in the back seat, right? The, you know, kind of the, the sex, drugs, and, and shenanigans that that happen late at night on on the, on the streets of of you know of the big city. Um, and the reason why I wanted to avoid those is not because I'm not attracted to those kinds of uh, ribald stories. I think we all are in a little bit, but in fact that we've heard those before. Those are those are stories that are part of pop culture um, and have been for you know generations. Um, and the other thing I wanted to avoid too, perhaps even more so, was the uh, uh, the cliche of the um, what I call the the, the cabby cardiologist, right? In fact, every time I mentioned I was writing a book about taxi drivers to, to, to my friends, they would, they would automatically say, oh, how many brain surgeons have you met driving cab? You know, how, how many engineers have you met driving cab? Um, you know, there's, there's, there is that cliche of the, of the prof professionally trained someone from somewhere else, somewhere far away, uh, usually, a, you know, someone of color who comes to, who comes to Canada, finds that his, his, usually his credentials are not recognized and is therefore is, is driving a cab instead of doing what he or she should be doing. Right. And again, I met some of those people, but not very many. And in the same respect, that was also a, um, that was also a, a story that we've already heard before. That was something that we, you know, th this, we already know this. Um, so so I wanted to avoid those. I wanted to avoid those stories, not because they were important, but because we'd heard them all before. So my 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 intention with with this book, which in this case was similar to everything else I've written, was I wanted to find things that I that I didn't know. I wanted to find stories that were surprising. I wanted to find kind of life narratives uh, 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 that no one would guess. That no one would guess, right? And and so. And and the drivers certainly delivered. I mean, I mean the 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 the, the wide ranging kinds of stories that I heard uh, uh, from drivers was 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 uh, it, it, yeah filled me with such a, with such a joy. I, I I loved I loved hearing these these new tales from from people. And I've forgotten your second second part of your question. <laughs> yeah, I really loaded you up there, didn't I? Um, by the way, because there is a little bit of a crackle, so for audiences that are hearing that crackle, I'm. Just gonna mute and unmute my mic when I'm not talking. Um, so if you ever felt something back to me and it takes me a second, Marcello, that is that's the reason why. Gotcha. The, the beauty of doing an online book launch. Um, so <laughs> th thank you for walking us through that, and I really appreciated that context in your introduction as well um, about the stories you wanted to avoid because they're 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 overplayed and sometimes the only stories that we ever get to hear. Yeah. Um, so the second part of that question is, you know, did you have any particular sort of pivotal or aha moments? Yeah. Um, you wanted to do what book you're writing and allowed you to move forward with the deeply personal intersectional stories that ended up in the final book. Yeah. What, what I started because, because I was looking for stories that I hadn't heard before. Um, 
I, I, you know, I, I was trying to find, you know, what do these, what do these drivers all have in common? And uh, um, it's their, their life narratives. It wasn't in there, right? They, you know, they, they, they'd all gone through such amazingly different things uh, uh, before they ever ended up behind the wheel of their, of their taxis. But what they seemed, what I discovered relatively early on in the project was what they all had in common. What I didn't expect, I guess, was that, well, I think we can all understand, we can all imagine taxi drivers as being hardworking, right? We can imagine the hours they spend, you know, behind the wheel. We can also, we can also imagine um, the kinds of nonsense they endure, you know, from, 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 from drunk passengers, from racist passengers, from all, all this, all the kind of the horrors that they might endure, you know, while, while they work. Um, and it is, and so we, we can, we can admire their, their, I guess, endurance. We can admire their hard work, um, but we don't envy it. But what, it, what, but it wouldn't surprise us to learn those things. But what surprised me was that how much of the, all the, how, how all the drivers that I met were like minor geniuses in their own life. Right. You know, if you go back and follow their life story back, they'd all kind of figured stuff out. They've all they all they all uh, broke whatever rules they needed to break. They, they kind of figured out the algorithm of their lives. They were kind of these these chess masters. You know, everyone, you know, whether, whether it was the guy who 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 avoided uh, prosecution from the from the Iraqi military by hiding himself behind behind a, the the bureaucracy, or the, or the guy who escaped from uh, uh, Czechoslovakia with his with his wife and daughter, and and you know and and you know somehow managed to to to, to end up with his, his with his broken car, you know, in a, in a refugee camp, and, the, and then to Edmonton, or this this couple in Calgary uh, uh, from from India who somehow managed to figure out the algorithm of crap paying jobs uh, whether you know build you know whether it's delivering pizza or driving you know to and from airports or hotel chambermaids or eventually driving cab and somehow use these like figured it out and became uh, um became successful raised their kids brought their brought parents from india and now have you know three generations living in a house that they paid off you know in calgary all these all these people they weren't just hardworking; they were like brilliant thinkers, and that's something that 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 they all I, that that I didn't ex I didn't expect to find that you know as the blue collar you expect calluses on the hands right and but these but all, all these all these drivers had like these just these amazing intellects and, and they just they were like like I said they were like chess masters and that was really um that to me was one of the most fascinating things about the project was was hearing how they they just figure stuff out. And we have to end it. There you go. I say the nimbleness and the tenacity is really evident. Yes. After the chapter, yeah, it's um, it it's very exciting. To, actually, I think that's like the narrative momentum of each, each chapter is is um, you know, like watching um or, or being able to witness through reading um, you know, each of your interview subjects being so nimble and adaptable um and not just figuring out how to survive but figuring out like who they are within the ecology of like of of, of driving you know and, and of, of people like all the very um you know pub public takes taxis you know it, it's yeah. a very good facing job and um yeah it's, it was really wonderful to read that um and and i suspect that if we were to look at any uh um, you know, working class or blue collar profession where there's an interface with the public, we would find those stories, we'd uncover more and more of those stories of the nimbleness and the adaptability uh, um, and just the emotional intelligence really to be able exactly. to- Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I think you're right. I, th I think I think when I could have just as easily written a book about Tim Horton's employees or, 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 or grocery store clerks or-, or, or you know, or, or butchers or bakers, right? Who, who just maybe who come from somewhere else and just, they've, they're, they just solved the problems. You know, they, they, they've, they've figured things out. The difference with cab drivers, I think, is that we have this strange, almost unnatural relationship with, with people in that profession, right? Cause we are, we are thrust into this into close quarters with a stranger um, for sometimes for a long period of time and rarely exchange much, right? I can't think of another kind of, 
clients, you know, business person relationship that is so weirdly silent, yet strangely intimate at the same time. We, we don't share that same space with with the person who, who who fills our coffee cup at Tim Hortons, but we we have this kind of this kind of proximity uh, it, it, from the back seat of a cab that that that's that's very unique, I think, to that profession. <laughs> I'm gonna pop my headphones in, Junior. Next um, answer, so that we don't have to do this muting all the time. But um, it it took you a while to be able to uncover this richness this tenacity, the nimbleness, the emotional intelligence. Um, and in fact, did you say in your introduction, not every driver wanted to talk with you. <laughs> um, right. In fact, many didn't want to divulge their personal lives. But some drivers were unflinchingly honest, it seems, um, and very ready to share. Um, and when I say this, I'm thinking of Mo Dali, um, in particular from Chapter 10, the Bully of Baghdad. Um, and I'm wondering if you would introduce Mo through uh, excerpt reading this evening. Yeah, sure. I yeah, Mo. Uh, um, people, I've been, I've been asked a few times by interviewers who who might if I they 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 couch the question very carefully. They say, I know Marcello must be hard to answer this question. It's like answering who's your favorite child, but which is your favorite cabbie? And I quite I quite quickly uh, uh, name uh, Mo as as one of my as is you know, kind of the, the top of that list. I mean, he's a guy who's who's. He's just a, a fascinating character uh, who grew up grew up in grew up in in Iraq. Uh, was a wrestler, and I was also a wrestler. So maybe there was something there uh, uh, that uh, um, that I that I could relate to. But I'm going to read a little bit from from the beginning of his chapter. Um, of uh, he, Mo fought two wars for Saddam uh, Hussein: one one against the Iranians and one against the Americans. And I want to talk a little bit about his first uh, his first time in the in the, in the battlefields. I should warn you too that. Mo has a tendency to say bad words, so just uh, uh, be warned. The Iraqi army drafted Mo after his 18th birthday in 1986. He showed up late for his draft date, and his superiors punished him by making him run, do squats, and crawl in the mud. Officers locked all the new recruits into their barracks on, their, on that first night. They handed us two buckets, one for piss and one for shit. In the morning, everyone was marched onto a bus. None of the new soldiers knew where they were going. The bus drove for three hours before stopping on the highway where officers divided the soldiers into three groups and ordered them onto military trucks. All three trucks drove off the highway and towards the Iranian border. There were some palm trees. They were burned and chopped, Mo remembers. We started to hear some bombing and then we were in the middle of it. The soldiers climbed out of the trucks and lined up in front of a colonel for their assignments. Mo was sent to the first unit. The colonel singled me out because I was the biggest and because I had the longest mustache, he said. It was the fashion at the time. Another officer handed Mo a chemical mask he didn't know how to use, an AK-47 he'd never fired, and ammunition he didn't know how to load. He didn't even know how to salute properly. The officer then pointed to a trench and told Mo to follow it. At six foot three, Mo stood taller than the trench was deep and his head and shoulders were exposed as he walked. He followed the trench for two kilometers until he reached some other soldiers. Then I started to hear bees, Mo said. They were going by it. They were going by me, buzzing above me, behind me, in front of me. A soldier shouted at Mo to get down. Those bees were not, bu were not bees, Mo said. They were bullets. If that sniper was any good, I would have been dead. That was my second day in the military. Mo's unit occupied a valley between an Iraqi-occupied hill and an Iranian-occupied mountain. Hundreds of landmines seeded the no-man's land just beyond the barbed wire coals, coils edging Mo's trench. Tripwires were rigged to ignite burn buried drums of napalm or to detonate vicious bounding mines that jumped a meter into the air before exploding. The area was so dangerous and so isolated that Mo's superiors considered his unit expendable. Every night, we were recorded as losses, Mo said. In the morning, they would count us and put us back in. The soldiers fighting in Mo's unit came from all over Iraq, including small villages in the far reaches of the country. Mo's urban middle-class upbringing meant he'd never been exposed to rural Iraqis before. I had culture shock, he said. He met Iraqis with strange names, Arab equivalents to Cletus and Bullybob, Mo said. 
They were far more superstitious and religious than the Baghdadis he grew up with. Many wouldn't spend any of their army stipend before offering the money to their village imam back home as required by their Shiite faith. Mo equated their religious devotion with gullibility and naivete. They're true believers in that bullshit, Mo said. He spoke with patronizing affection. Deep inside, I sympathize with them because they didn't know any better. They live in marshes. They raise water buffaloes. But they are pure, nice people. Still, none of this mattered in the trenches. The Iranian bombs didn't distinguish rural from urban, rich from poor, believer from skeptic. Everybody cared for everybody. Everybody hurt when someone was lost, Mo said. The horrors of trench warfare, unseen since the First World War, united them. So did death. Mo saw dead bodies for the first time when an officer ordered him to empty the pockets of two killed Iraqi soldiers who lay in the back of a truck. That will scar you, Mo said no matter how much you say you are tough. Mo came close to being killed himself. He'd recently returned home from home leave and was handing out cookies to his fellow soldiers. When you come back, you don't come back empty handed, he said. Your buddies have been sitting for a month eating army food. You bring them a treat. It was Mo's night to fetch water for the camp, but since he was busy divvying out baked goods, one of the other soldiers offered to take his turn fetching water. He never returned. The soldiers hit with an Iranian 60 millimeter mortar shell three minutes after he left Mo's tent. You can hear the 80 millimeter shells coming. You can hear the 120 millimeter shells, but you don't hear the 60 millimeter shells coming, Mo said. That was supposed to be me. That was my turn. Mo's unit faced nearly constant bombing from Iranian positions, and soldiers learned that a particularly heavy day of bombing signaled a nighttime ground assault. The Iranians used to throw waves of people at us, Mo said those gullible rural people. When the Iranian infantry advanced, Mo blindly fired his rifle over his head and above the top of the trench. He occasionally hurled a grenade if he felt the enemy was getting close. You peek every now and then, he said. You don't have time to think. All you have to know is that you're shooting. You're shooting and shooting until you're done shooting. People often ask Mo if he killed anyone. Yes, I did. But it's not like in the movies. It's not like Brad Pitt shooting at Germans. Mo said. There's no background music, nothing in slow motion, nothing in black and white. I have no words for it. Only chaos, survival, adrenaline. Despite this chaos, Mo claims he never felt afraid during the war. The bombs and constant threat of death became part of his daily life, as mundane as making tea and smoking cigarettes. A night without bombing was so rare as to be disconcerting. When it was quiet, We'd yell at the Iranians, come on, guys, send us a couple of bombs so we can sleep. I became, I became something different than I was before. What did you become? I asked Mo. I became a bit of an animal. Whew. I mean, if we were in a large in-person room, we'd all be clapping. <laughs> um, Thanks. That passage really stuck with me. And um, just to focus in on, you know, one small thing, I love that you, uh, within the prose itself in that chapter, wrote out that you asked the question, what did you become? You know, um, I loved hearing your voice in there, because what did you become? Um, it, it almost is like a linchpin question that gets asked throughout this book. You know, what, what do any of mm. us become when we are um, coerced into such extreme conditions or, or you know, or, or we, we have experiential trauma. Um, and, and I think this book really handles um, that so well. And, and again, I, I've been singing your praises like every other book thank reviewer, you. again, coast to coast, I just, I want to thank you for that work. And when I was reading chapter 10 in particular, um, I thought about you, Marcello, as, as much as I thought about Mo, in fact, and mm. I thought it must take both compassion and an incredible shrewdness um, and, and skill to write nonfiction that is, is working on these different levels. Um, you know, you've, you've shown once again that relationship building is the key approach to nonfiction writing. So, my next question is for all the present or future nonfiction writers or journalists uh, listening this evening. Uh, what are your words of wisdom in engaging in, in ethical and honest conversations with interview subjects? Well, that's a great question. You know, I think, I think the number one thing is, is, a sim is, is simply 
time, you know, time with the subject. Um, I spent, I spent you know, over, over two days, I probably spent six hours with Mo and then, it, and then had some follow-up questions for him afterwards and then interviewed someone who knew him in, in, in Halifax and then interviewed his, uh, uh, his arts teacher, uh, uh, when, when, when he was, when he was, uh, when he was an arts student in Halifax. Um, and so that, that for me is the most important thing. I think, you know, I could never have written this book or any of my other other books that focus on individual people if I had a half an hour with them. Uh, you know, like it's it's, it's just it, it it takes them out, and it takes that time. I mean, it's it's, it's almost a cliche. It takes that amount of time to earn their trust. It kind of does, but it's more than just that. I think it takes that amount of time. People people have told their stories all the time, right? People have told their their personal stories, and and so, you know, Mo was I think Mo, Mo's was rehearsed. And everyone else's was rehearsed, so I got I got the rehearsed story off the top. You know, we 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 sat down there, and 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 he he gave me he gave me his story after 15, 20 minutes. But then if you just sit there and don't go anywhere, and he and and your your subject is 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 now compelled to to speak more, you just go on and on and on. And I never get. The, the gold in a conversation never comes in those first 15 or 20 minutes. It always comes much, much, much later. And so my, my biggest, my, yeah, my, my biggest bit of wisdom, I guess is for, for anyone is spend as much time as you possibly can with the people you want to write about. Now, the kind of writing I do, you know, the, the, these, these nonfiction books where I could, I can go and travel and spend, you know, two weeks in Halifax talking to cabbies, you know, a news journalist can't do that, you know. You know, you know that is, is a different type of work. I, I don't expect to see the, that kind of in-depth, you know, uh, uh, characters characterizations of people in in a in a, in a Globe and Mail news story because those those journalists simply don't have the time. But I do, you know, and, and, and writers li writers like me do, and so we have to take that time as much as much as possible. Um, when I do my, you know, my the last kind of. In my book, Walls, where I traveled around the world to different places, I would spend a month in every place. That was that was my that was my rule, and that's a that's a luxury that I have because of the kind of writing that I do. It's a luxury uh, because you know I could I could earn grants you know to to, to fund such long trips. Um, so I don't I don't I don't take that for granted. Um, but it really it really is about the more time you can spend with someone, the better. And you have to be a good. You have to be a good audience member, a good audience to to, to your to your uh, your subjects as well. And and this is going to sound maybe this is going to sound like you have to be fake with them, but you you don't have to be fake. But you should laugh at their jokes, Amber Dawn. And, and you know and, and when and, you know you should you should even if they're not funny, you know, and, and and you should express surprise when you when you get a sense that they they they're telling you something that you should be surprised by. You know, I think I think I think it's I think it's a it's a it's a, you got to be a you got to be you want to you want to give them a sense of enjoyment when they're sitting with you. It shouldn't be a it shouldn't be an interrogation. Mm -hmm. it, 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 and if they want to brag about how tough they were when they were growing up and wrestling for the Iraqis, then let them let them brag. You know you know you, you let, let them let them run, let them run wild and, and, uh, and be a be a be a good audience member. Yeah, I love it. And you got to meet them where they're at including where their humor is at, where their sensibilities, where their idiosyncratic voice is at. And sometimes literally where they're, they're at, like go to their favorite bars or restaurants with them. Like all, all of that counts. Yeah. You know, there was, there was some, some drivers I talked to uh, uh, who said things that I found offensive. Um, and, and, and I, you know, in that moment, I'm not going to challenge them on that. You know, you know what I mean. Like, uh, um, I, I had a cabbie uh, talk about how you know, it, was a, it was a huge Trump supporter, and kind of went off on, on how wonderful Trump was, and I just sat there, you know, you know, b biting my tongue. If it was any, if it was any other situation, uh, I, I would have, I would have spoken up and, and said, "Well, well, you know, I have an opinion on that, but that was not what I'm. I'm there, I'm there to listen yeah. and 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 to take it in, and I I could choose whether or not I want to include those kinds of discussions in in the book or not." Um, um, that becomes the that becomes the writer's pr prerogative in the end. Um, but you should let people, like you say, you know, you know, meet them where they're at, and e even if where they're at is 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 not a place you you, you necessarily want to be. Yeah, um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about another one of the chapters that really stuck with me 
Um, and I, and I know from feedback from other readers, it really stuck with other readers too. And, um, you know, it stuck to me in terms of compassion and, and relationships once again, and that's chapter 10, uh, the women of Ikwe. And I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about Ikwe safe rides, um, and, and what you discovered while meeting those particular drivers. Yeah. So, you know, almost everywhere I, I, I went kind of, you know, it was, it was hard for me not to see the drivers as, as, as heroes, you know, like everything we've talked about already, right? These, these, these chess masters, these, these hard workers. In Winnipeg, though, the driver, the, the, the Winnipeg taxi drivers have a, they're not heroes. They, they, they have a terrible reputation um, for treating uh, women passengers, especially Indigenous women, horribly. You know, there's, 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 there's harassment, there's assaults, there's, there's, all, there's a, a, um, uh, uh, sexual suggestive comments that are made um, or, 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 or they don't pick up indigenous women or they demand indigenous women pay up front or this sort of stuff. So, so women in Winnipeg, especially indigenous women feel unsafe in taxi cabs. And I think that, I think, I, I think I can, I can say that with confidence that they, and, and there's reasons for that. So to counter that, a, a, a group of, 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 of women started a service of, a essentially a volunteer service. So, so women who, ha who owned a car would connect with women who needed a ride and they would connect on a, on a, on a dedicated Facebook page. And, and so this, is, this became a way to, to circumvent uh, uh, the, the dangers and anxieties of, of, of taking regular cabs in Winnipeg. They called it Ikwe Safe Rides. And so you have to be, a, you have to be a, a, all the drivers are women, all the passengers are women, or maybe a, a guy on a date or, or you know, uh, you know with, 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 but you have to be a woman to be, or, or identify as a woman to be, um, uh, uh, to be a member of of, of Ikwe. and it, and it, what it ended up forming was not just this kind of this service, but a uh, it, it formed this really fascinating community of of of, of women uh, in Winnipeg um, who not only got not only found someone to give them a ride to where they needed to go. But also someone to talk to and, and develop these relationships that were very they were quite personal. Um, that's amongst the drivers themselves, but also between drivers and passengers. So what Ikwe created in, in Winnipeg was this quite this beautiful kind of uh, 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 yeah beautiful community community of, of women and women of a certain typically women of, of, of a certain socioeconomic stage, right? You no, know, these are women who didn't have cars uh, mm -hmm. that, that that needed rides, and the women who were drivers. You know uh, the stories that I heard. I heard from some of them, but you know they were they were also kind of uh, uh, the same kind of socioeconomic level. The only difference is that they they happened to have an old beater that they could drive around uh, 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 at nights or to, to drive some women around. So it was it was a really wonderful kind of uh, community that they that they formed. Mm. Yeah, it. Um, I love I loved that chapter so very much. Um, as someone who's taken cabs in Winnipeg and other places, as as a woman. Um, I really deeply appreciated that chapter and um, it, it reminded me about the idea of like being able to safely go from A to B. It, it is a social justice issue, right? Yeah. And depending on, um, you know, depending on the climate, like factors like racism or homophobia in our local communities, you know, taking a taxi ride can be risky for for some of us and and i think you know not just in winnipeg but again from coast to coast um it can be risky for indigenous women in particular um, mm -hmm. yeah so i loved i loved this chapter and i really appreciated the opportunity to think about traveling from a to b as a social justice issue and who gets to do so safely um who doesn't and but mm. and in particular what what can be done about it um so I do want to piggyback off of that chapter a little bit and ask you, do you think there's a call to action in Driven? Um, mm. You know, are there things that you hope the book inspires readers to consider more deeply? Um, and it could be anything like labor justice or just everyday, you know, interpersonal relationships or transactional relationships. Like what's, what's the call to action in Driven? Oh, what a great question. I, I don't know. I don't know if I, I don't know if I've thought about it in those terms before. I think what I've, what I would really, because because the focus of, of, of the book was kind of the personal life stories of of, of these of these men and women, um, and how fascinating they were. I think what I would love for for readers to to, to come away with is is this is the realization that we're surrounded at all times 
by these incredible stories. You know, you know the, the the people we meet, the people maybe we don't even meet, the people who 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 we share uh, our oxygen with, who we share who we share the sidewalks with. Um, the, it's a cliche, but you know they contain such multitudes, right? And I think we should be we should. I personally derive great comfort and, and joy from that. Just, just knowing that I'm always surrounded by such remarkable lives. And that doesn't mean that we should pester strangers for their life stories. That doesn't mean, and I would hate, and, and the drivers would hate me if this is what happened. If, 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 if people read the book and now jump in the back seats and demand the life history of their cab drivers, you know, that's not, you know, drivers, some drivers just don't want to talk. Uh, they, they're, they're quite happy when you, when you stare at your phone for the entire ride. Um, but just knowing that 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 everyone around us has gone through so much stuff, you know that that that, that we've all we've all fought our own personal wars. You know, they don't. It doesn't have to be the you know against the Iranians in, in the battlefields of, of Iraq. It, it it could be anything. Um, the Ikwe drivers that I that I write about, you know, face their own their own challenges with with kind of. D domestic abuse and, and and addiction sometimes, and even something as simple as as you know crippling shyness. You know that, that, that these and these are all the kinds of sorts of things that, that, that these are all the battles that, that people around us have fought. Um, we don't have to know those stories, but I think we have to know that those stories are there. Mm. And it is true too. You know, coming out coming off of the pandemic, you know, you know the, these drivers, they were always working. You know, you know, you know, you know, they were, they were there. We, we banged our pots for, 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 uh, for, you know, frontline medical workers and we, you know, d d deservingly so, but uh, those men and women were still driving us around at, 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 at great, at great personal risk too. And I think we should appreciate the people who do these, th do the jobs that we don't want, you know, who, who, you know, who, 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 who work those long hours driving people around, who, who, to pour a coffee at the Tim Hortons or whatever, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, they, 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 they deserve, they deserve some, they deserve our respect for sure. Absolutely. Um, I have one further question before we turn it over to the audience audience. I hope that you are dropping your questions into the chat. I will be happy to receive them. Um, so you, you did mention the pandemic and the pandemic's been an incredibly difficult time for so many of us to, to maintain relationships, especially newer relationships. Um, but you have had some drivers read this, perhaps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> how, how's that been? How's the response been? And have, have you been able to talk to any of uh, the taxi drivers uh, since the book's come out? I have. You know, I, had to, I thought it's funny. I thought the book was done uh, la in January 2020 and then the pandemic hit. And I'm like, well, I can't, you know, I have to go, I have to follow up with these, with some of these people and find out what it, what it, what the pandemic has meant to their lives as drivers. So I added, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, a I call it the pandemic postscript, which I was I added to the end of the book where I followed up, I followed up with someone that saw how they were doing. Um, so I did, so I thought I was done and then I went back and did some more proper work and then I was, you know, done a second time. And uh, yeah, a lot of them, a lot of them did read it. Um, uh, a, a lot of them were, well, everyone that I spoke to, at least when they spoke to me about it, were, were, were happy with their, with their portrayal uh, uh, in it. I was worried about, we talked about Mo earlier. I was worried about Mo because, you know, Mo, uh, he's a pretty polarizing figure in the book. You know, he's a guy who's, who's, I think, intense, intensely creative and smart and sensitive, but he's also a bully and, and arrogant and, 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 and all these things too. Like, uh, uh, it's funny, uh, some people I talk to, Mo's their favorite driver and others, he's their least favorite. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wasn't sure how Mo would respond to. And like I said, Mo's this six foot three ex, ex wrestling soldier. I didn't want Mo, I didn't want to be on Mo's bad side. Um, <laughs> And so he, t he he saw the book and he texted me and he, and he he said he laughed from start to finish from his of his chapter. Uh, he said he he said he, he said his friends read it and they said that's you that's you one hundred percent Mo. Mm -hmm. I mean the, the, you know so I was um he was he was he was he was really happy with it and not at all um upset of the, of kind of the, the the warts and all portrayal that 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 I gave him. I think he appreciates it and that's what makes him a really fascinating character too. Like I don't know if I I don't know if I have you know. You know, we some of us have the large egos, and myself among them. But it's mine is far too fragile 
<laughs> and and, and to, to, to have dealt with something like that. And, and Mo just Mo just rolled with it. Like uh, um, he was very happy to see it. Now and it's funny. And now I feel like if I go to Halifax, which I will be next week, um, uh, uh, maybe I'll maybe Mo and I will hang out, which would be crazy. <laughs> um, I'm just going to take a peek at the chat to see if there's any questions from audiences coming in. Um, and again, audience, I would encourage you to take advantage of uh, the last 15 minutes we have for this event. Um, again, Marcello is, uh, you know, what I consider a leader in um, this particular type of in-depth and humanizing nonfiction writing. So great, great time to be able to snap up some of his expertise. Um, but since it does seem like it's just you and I for mm -hmm. a little bit longer, um, will you walk me through a timeline? I sort of want to return to the question that um, time is sort of... Uh, you know, a key factor or the linchpin to being able to even arrive at this particular um, multifaceted um, level of writing. Um, so like how, how long did you spend with this book from like inception to, um, yay, you're launching in a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> um, it had to, you know, it's, it, it, it's, it's a little more than, a little more than two years. Like it, the book, the book should have come out last fall. You know that was, but it, it it got it got delayed because of the because of the pen because of the pandemic. So it came out in the spring. So uh, about two years, and it was the the it was all about it was it was about the travel, right? It it was like it, it was do, doing a lot of research that I could do on online, and then finding drivers to talk to me. You know, uh, there I learned pretty quick uh, that there's two kinds of taxi drivers in this country. There's the there's a driver who doesn't want to talk. And there's the driver who doesn't want to stop talking, and and so and so I really I really wanted those that that that's people from that second group, um, and so a lot of my a lot of my time was finding drivers who are who who are a willing to talk and 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 to ha had a had a fascinating story story to tell, um, and I knew I couldn't just I could just jump in the back of a cab and 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 press my driver for their stories. That wasn't going to work, and that would be intensely expensive. Also, uh, that 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 was a, that was a very smart use of grant money. Um, and so it was it was kind of and also you know not everyone wants to talk to give their life stories to a stranger in their back seat. So a lot of it was me finding people who knew drivers or you know someone who knew somebody who drove cab or someone who'd heard about this guy or, or so it was a it was a lot of. Um, I had a third party in a, in a lot of ones. Someone, someone who could, who could mm -hmm. even make the briefest of introductions. So I wasn't going in as, as, as you know, as just, as just another guy in the back seat on, on, on a, on a, on a Friday night or, or whatever. And I made sure too, that I didn't do any of the interviews in those cabs either. I didn't want to be, I didn't want it to be this, you know, driver client relationship, you know? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to meet them where, where they felt comfortable and had the time to talk, and and sometimes it was on their kitchen kitchen tables, and 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 sometimes it was restaurants, and, and an awful lot of times it was at Tim Hortons. You know, I spent I spent an awful lot of time, you know, amongst those brown tiles for the, yeah. in, in, in those in those two years. You drank more double doubles than you care to admit. A lot, a lot of a lot of bad coffee. Um, but uh, um, and then I had to do a lot of I did a lot of research as well on. You know, I, I wanted to inform the book a little bit with with some historical, you know, who who were the first women drivers? You know, who were the mm -hmm. wh wh when did the, when did the demographics of of taxi drivers change in this country? You know, when, when did it when did it be, when did it become a job for 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 new immigrants and, and drivers mm -hmm. of color? And you know, and so I, so there was a lot, and I love that. I mean, I don't know about you, but research, I I, I rather research than write, uh, um, and 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 so so so. Digging through all those things was 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 such a joy. Uh, um, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know I know far more about the taxi industry than I ever thought I ever ever would. And 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 of all that I learned, very little of it is in the book. But I just need, I needed it to, I needed it to be some sort of context. I was going to ask you about that because the amount of research and contextualizing that you do, um, you know, to sort of support the conversations that you have is really um, clear right from chapter one. So chapter one's the old school. You begin by talking um, with, with Peter um, and, you know, Peter really represents, he, Peter was in Mississauga. Do I have that right? So Peter yeah, was in yeah. Mississauga and he's, you know, um, a cabbie in, and what we might consider like a, a 
bygone era, like in the late sixties and onward. Um, and there was so much context to help support what Peter was telling you in terms of, you know, migration ch changing, um, and also just the changing industry. Like I was so fascinated yeah. that he used to drive school kids and then suddenly schools weren't using taxis anymore to drive children around, which I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> Who knew that schools would have ever used taxis to drive children around back in the day? Um, so, so I loved it, but I, I, I did wonder, you know, how much research made it into the final page. And I think like many, many nonfiction writers, you know, even uh, novelists, uh, any of us actually, any writers at all, um, we might research um, a fair bit more than what we can actually use. At the end. For sure. And we love, and you know, I, th I think for me, my worst form of procrastination is research. Cause you know, I, I will, I will sit and, 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 and research and research and research and not, not write a single word on the page and convince myself that I'm working where really I'm not really, I should be writing the story. And instead mm -hmm. I'm saying, well, let's, let's, let's dig through another online journal. Who, who was driving cabs in Paris in 1907? I really need to know that. Uh, um, and, and so you can, you can convince yourself you're working when really you're, you're, it's kind of like, you're kind of playing. Yeah. I love to also convince myself, though, that that kind of play or that kind of research, it all, it all ends up somewhere. I think so. It's just in, um, you know, like how keen I am to approach the subject matter in the end. And um, yeah, I, I mean, there could probably even be a, a follow up, like a sequel to Driven. Not not that you have to write that, but I'm sure there's there was so much more. Um, but speaking of sequel or a follow up. I know you, you know, you're, you're prolific. You've already graced us with five books and none of them are, um, you know, none of them are about puppies and kittens. Like they're all very <laughs> challenging books. Um, not that dogs can't be challenging sometimes, but you know, they, they really, um, they require, um, a strong sense of ethic and purpose, compassion, active listening, all of that and, and time, you know, a lot of time. So, are you are you ready to start again? What uh, what's next? If you feel I'm, willing to answer that, I also yeah. want to respect that it, it's a pandemic. There doesn't have yeah. to be anything we're up to right next. So, <laughs> well, I'm going to write a biography of my son's puppy. Is what I really is. It's going to plan on doing. Please do. <laughs> children's book. How about that? Sounds really relaxing in comparison. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm, I'm started, I'm in the very early stages about a book, um, uh, about, uh, uh migrant workers in, 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 uh, Canada, uh, you know, you know, in, in a way, uh, uh, in a similar vein as, as, as driven, I suppose. Um, but who are, who are the people we let do the, these jobs, but don't let them stay, yeah. you know, and, 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 uh, and, uh, um, I think there's, a, there's some interesting stories to be, to be found there too. So I, I, I I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking at that, but I don't know about you. Ember, Don, during the pandemic, did you get anything done? Like, I, I had a really hard time being a writer with this kind of this gloomy anxiety surrounding me. You know, like I had all this time to work, um, but didn't have any impulse to work. You know, I, I had no, I had no creative juice at all. I was just sitting watching the same crappy Netflix series that everyone else was watching. Whereas, I, you know, I, I could have learned a second language, you know, during 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 all that time, but I, I sure as hell didn't. Uh, um, but uh, but I watched Tiger King. You know, like it feels, it feels. I, I couldn't even read uh, uh, during the yes. during the past year. Um, I know not everyone's like that. I have a friend, Ali Bryan, here in, in in Calgary. She like wrote two novels or something ridiculous, and you know, I have to hate her for that. Uh, but most of the people I t most of the people I, I I talked to just couldn't get anything done. Yeah, I watched Love Island. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm. That's heterosexual nonsense. Like I'm a <laughs> woman, you know. That's going. That's going deep into lethargy for me, um, and escapism. Um, <laughs> so you know, and, and I think it's. I think it's great that we're saying this. To be honest, I think it's necessary that we're saying this. Like, here's two writers. You know, we've 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 both authored five books, um, and and are very invested in our in our local literary um, communities and. And 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 we are at a standstill right now. Both of us. I haven't I haven't written anything new. Um, hmm. 
I, you know, and I, and I have those ideas moldering and I've started my research and, you know, I have a sample chapter, but it, it is tough right now. It is tough. So for all the writers out there or anyone who's trying to find um, creative inspiration right now, like, it's not you, you know, like, don't, you know, don't <laughs> yeah. let the negative voice turn in on yourself and deficiencies in yourself, because it's a very tough time to produce new work right now. Um, I, I rest assured that you're a genius and you have, you know, and you have a, a sincere curiosity about the world. So we're going to see something from you again. Um, I can't keep my mouth shut. So I'm going to write another angry book at some point. Good. <laughs> And there is, speaking of books, there is a question from the audience and it's just, what you know, what have you read and enjoyed recently? And I think that's a great one. Like, you know, maybe we're not writing a new book, but, but what's, what's been a good touchstone for you in terms of literature uh, over the last while? Uh, I just finished uh, Ivan Coyote's book of, uh, of letters, uh, which was so, so beautiful and, 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 and yeah, just what a, what a gorgeous book that was. And I just finished also, um, uh, Hala Aliyan, who's this amazing uh, Palestinian American author, and uh, her second novel, *The Arsonist City*, came out this year. And uh, her book, *The Salt Houses*, is one of my favorite novels I've ever read. I was so excited about *The Arsonist City*, and it's a beautiful, beautiful book. Um, you know, a lot of it takes place in 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 Lebanon and in Beirut, which is you know has been a, a, a city in the forefront of of kind of. A lot, of, a lot of pain in the last in the in the last year, mm. um, and uh, uh, Hala and I are doing an event together uh, at a festival coming up mm. in the fall. So that's that was exciting too. But yeah, so it, it, those it's it's been a, those are the last last two books I've I've, I've gotten to. Um, but e even as wonderful as those two books were, it was it was um, I had to for, I had to force myself to sit down and 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 and. and it crack those open as much as excited as I was about them. Uh, and as much as I loved them and I did, it was still, it still, it still felt like, um, an underused muscle a little mm. bit. I was, um, I had mentioned on my Twitter that I've been reading, uh, YA yeah, yeah. Uh, young adult fiction, almost the entire pandemic. I needed something that was like, very plot driven, you know, and, and had that quicker pace with like narrative momentum. It, it, it's, it's been fun. I've, yeah, no read, doubt. I've read some, some really great work actually. I've, I've learned to appreciate a brand new genre, but this is the first nonfiction book I've read in, I think the last two years. And mm. I'm so thankful to you. I really, um, um, it was great to, um, just really think deeply about individuals. Um, and, you know, you, you, you've talked a couple times during um, our interview together about the necessity of time, you know, and getting to know people is in, you know, getting to these stories is benefited by time. Um, and, you know, I, I just really feel like it's, um, the antithesis or the anecdote even for um, this, you know, fast paced, virtual information heavy um, reality that we've been trapped in for the last little while. And I really encourage audiences to pick up Driven, the secret lives of taxi drivers, um, to allow yourself to think about human relationships in a slower, more careful, uh, and perhaps different way than you've been able to think about them for the last year. Um, again, I'm, I'm gassing you up because we also are arriving, um, at the end of our time together, um, before we leave, is there anything that perhaps I've missed or that you would like, uh, people to know about the book? Is it available on audiobook? Where do you like folks to buy your books in particular or any other, um, way to keep in touch with you? um while they're reading driven and beyond yeah sure so uh, yeah i'm on i'm on all the social medias i'm easy enough to find uh i'm at dicintio on, on on twitter um the book is available as an audio and i just heard this i just heard a sample of the of the audio recently i'm like wow that dude reads my book way better than i read my book <laughs> like that was impressive um so that's 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 out that's out there somewhere i mean uh, obviously support your local your local independent bookstores i mean that's a savior for the over the over the pandemic too. You know, a, a shout out to, to Shelf Life Books here in Calgary, which yes. I will I will say is my favorite bookstore in Canada. Um, you know, they were <laughs> they were delivering books to my front step during during this time, and uh, uh, um, 
yes, so was Amazon, but not not not, not the same people that I'm used to seeing uh, uh, down at the store and who who are I know are who supported the the local community you know, since, since their inception. So wh wh whoever that shop is in your town, that's where you can find my book. I hope. Oh, thank you so much for that. And I see thank Maya you. from world on the street. Toronto has returned on the screen. Um, yeah. hi, Maya, I hope you've been enjoying this conversation. We'll turn it over to you. I have. It's been a joy to listen to you both. Thank you so very much uh, for this thoughtful conversation in celebration of the launch of driven. Um, and also promoting having curiosity about and respect for the stories, both known and unknown of all people you encounter in life. It's a really important message I think we can all take home, um, especially during this time. Mm. So thank you both. Thank you, so, no, thank you so much for having me. Amber Dawn, thank you so much. Thank you both. Have a good evening, everyone. Yes, and thank you everyone tuning in at home for sure. Uh, please go find Driven, The Secret Lives of Taxi Drivers uh, at Queen Books in East Toronto. The buy link can be found in the YouTube comment stream and also on the banner below. We'll be back uh, in September from the 16th to the 26th every day uh, for Watts 2021, the 32nd annual Word on the Street Festival and our second time hosting it 100% virtual. Thanks again for joining us and have a great evening. <laughs>